Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second installment of our ICCJ Invited Speaker Seminar Series for 2022. Today, we are absolutely delighted to uh, have Dr. Shersti Lone from the University of uh, Oslo. Uh, Shersti is an associate professor in the Department of Criminology and Sociology of Law, uh, and her primary research interest is the role of judicialization and criminal punishment in the making of the global social uh, order. So her book, Advocates of Humanity, Human Rights and Geos in International Criminal Justice, which represents the focus of her talk today, was published in 2019 by Oxford University Press and received widespread praise in the academic community and uh, beyond. Shersti has also published widely on other topics such as privacy and data protection, gender, crime and sexual violence, and drones. And last but certainly not least, in 2019, she received the Young Criminologist Award from the European Society of Criminology. So we very much look forward to your presentation. I would like to thank Dr. Teresa Dagenhardt, uh, who uh, was absolutely instrumental in making this uh, seminar uh, possible. I really want to thank Teresa. And Shesti, the floor is yours. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, such a pleasure to be able to um, to be here uh, in digital terms. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to to um, hearing your reflections and your comments. Shall I say, can you also see me uh, in the presentation mode? Or. Yes, we can. Yes, you can. OK, so. Um, so I just wanted to, to again thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, I feel very honored to to be able to to speak to you here today. Um, also because uh, several of, I mean, your institute has had a huge impact, and there are many familiar names uh, and some faces also um, from your your institute and from your faculty that I am very familiar with and have had a huge impact on. Um, on this uh, this field that I hope to contribute to. Um, before before starting, I just wanted to give you a bit of a heads up uh, on my current research before I talk about the book. Uh, also, in terms of finding sort of potential points of intersections with with the people that have joined us today. Uh, and as you briefly mentioned, Alessandro, I I was um, recently given a grant. On a on a project uh, called Just Exports, promoting justice in a time of friction, Scandinavian penal exports, and and that project is my main preoccupation these days, and it um, it is about sort of uh, understanding the uh, the penal power when it disembeds from the nation state frame by looking at how the Scandinavian countries in particular export uh, criminal justice practices and discourses and modes of thinking uh, also combined with humanitarian uh, and security discourses. So that is one of the major projects that I'm working on now. And the second project is uh, on the uh, socio-legal aftermaths of the terror attack in Norway on the 22nd of July, looking again at uh, understanding how has um, what have been the legal effects in a more sociological and profound um, way after that terror attack. Um, but the topic of today uh, will be based on this book that you mentioned, Advocates of Humanity, Human Rights NGOs in International Criminal Justice. Now, this book um, deals with um, it builds sort of on, on it builds on research on international criminal justice during the course of more or less a decade through my postgraduate and PhD research, uh, which is basically what the book is based on. And empirically, it is based on an analysis of the role of NGOs and especially human rights NGOs uh, in international criminal justice. Now, why this focus on NGOs will become clear shortly. But the focus on the book, though, uh, isn't only on sort of mapping out the extent of NGO activities and influence. I mean, other scholars um, have uh, are also concerned with doing that. But what I wanted to do and what I've hopefully tried to do is to use the role of NGOs in international criminal justice as sort of a point of departure for asking bigger, 
broader questions about the normative role of NGOs in the project of international criminal justice, or even maybe the fight against uh, impunity and the fight for global justice in their own terminology. You know, as a criminologist and sociologist of law by background, I was interested in these questions about what characterizes punishment gone global and how international criminal justice is sort of constituted by and of the global. So in other words, I was interested in the structures and the ideas that give shape to the field of international criminal justice and ultimately presents criminal law as the most meaningful response to global violence and humanitarian emergencies. So today I will basically give an outline of some of the main arguments detailed in this book, and I will more or less follow the chapter outline, which means that after some introductory comments on research questions and methodology and my um, and my approach, I'll spend this talk trying more or less to sort of deconstruct or dissect international criminal justice as a social field, focusing on the structures and the imaginaries that characterize it. This means that I will talk about spaces. Where does international criminal justice take place? I will talk about networks. How is it driven by connections and disconnections? And advocates, individuals and transnational activists. From this focus on how the field of international criminal justice um, is materially structured, I will then move on to talk about the dominating discourses and mentalities in the field, especially in this human rights sensibility of international criminal justice. And as a way of mapping out these imaginations of global justice, I focused first on the penal imagination of the field, then on how justice um, for victims are imagined, and then the role of humanitarian reason in driving the field of international criminal justice itself. Finally, I will address the question of how international criminal justice relates to the work of crafting a global moral order, albeit one that is situated and political and dominant, rather than universal as it claims to be. Now, so this last bit of this talk will therefore bring us back to where international criminal justice and perhaps more, more broadly multilateralism and liberal internationalism even is today and how all of these accusations of being in crisis may also open up a space um, to be more critical and to be more self-reflective about the pursuit of global justice through international criminal law. However, before delving into these arguments, I first want to point out some of the paradoxes and the unexpected challenges with international criminal justice that got me interested in this field alt altogether. Now, well over a decade ago, uh, yeah, uh, I wrote a master thesis on the different conceptualizations of justice for the conflict that had devastated the region of northern Uganda for decades. And, and I wanted to bring this up because for all the, you know, the students that might be listening to it's it's um, it's good to know that there is sort of a trajectory of interest and, and research um, builds on on what one has done before. Right. So so I still, you know, my master thesis was sort of the, the kickoff point for this research interest of mine that have lasted for, for well now well over a decade and a bit more. But um, at this time, though, in 2006, if I don't remember wrong, the UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, this Norwegian guy called Johan Egelan, had described the situation uh, in Uganda as the biggest forgotten, neglected humanitarian emergency in the world and an epicenter of terror, quote unquote. Today, of course, much more is known about this conflict, and we are now currently waiting to see whether the appeal of the sentence of Dominic Ongwen in The Hague will be um, taken up or not. Um, we can talk more about that, obviously, but however, in the course of the more than 20 year long conflict in northern Uganda, there were human rights reports on the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA under the leadership of the now infamous Joseph Kony, that the LRA had abducted an estimated 30,000 children, forced them to become soldiers or sex, sex um, slaves, and that such children became also their only source of conscripts 
also obviously as this policy fed, fed discontent. And at the height of the conflict, roughly 2001 to 2004, over 90% of his troops were abducted children, some of them as young as seven or eight years old. To bind them permanently to the group, they were, they were forced to commit atrocities against their own families and against each other. However, under the pretext of protecting the local population, the Ugandan government forcibly displaced almost the entire Acholi population in the north into so-called protected villages. And these camps were just um, were just in devastating conditions. Besides report of overt physical violence committed by the government soldiers, murder, rape, torture, they would also um, they would also the, the, the soldiers would also consider anyone outside of the camps to be a rebel and would therefore consider them a target. And the scholar Adam Branch, among others, have paralleled these camps actually to concentration camps. Given that, he says, um, internment is an explicit government policy that targeted the Acholi as a group and has led to tens or even hundreds of thousands of deaths and to the slow destruction of an entire ethnic group, he wrote. So in this situation, here enters the ICC, the International Criminal Court, this newly established court into a situation where there were really no big power politics involved. There wasn't Palestine to say it like that. And with a clear example of, of sort of inhumanity, of evil incarnate, on all accounts, the Ugandan situation was sort of considered by The Hague as an easy first case for the court. However, it turned out to be far from an easy first case. First of all, it, when the ICC intervened in the conflict, it intervened in ongoing peace talks between the warring parties, the LRA and the Ugandan government. And when arrest warrants were issued for the five top commanders of the LRA, it meant that the LRA no longer had any incentive to lay down their arms as they would be sent to The Hague if they turned up to the negotiation um, table. In other words, the situation came to epitomize one of the most difficult dilemmas with justice in ongoing conflict, namely that between peace versus justice. And this obviously didn't fly very well with the local population because they, above all, wanted the fighting to stop. They wanted to return to their homes. They wanted to get back to their children to carry on with their lives, not necessarily to attain a form of justice, which meant in effect, really, that a few rebel commanders that at the time was hiding in the bush landscape with little food and a lot of running would get sort of a green card to, Europe, to a European prison. It also didn't help um, the local population's view of the ICC that the court only went after one side of a conflict that was a de facto civil war between the LRA and the Ugandan government. And this, this type of selective prosecution led the court to be seen as not only biased, but essentially a tool used by the Ugandan government to win the war. And this relates to another difficult dilemma with international criminal justice, namely the ICC's relation to state power. It's much easier for the ICC to go after state adversaries than to go after sitting heads of state. And Dominic Ongwen, pictured here, is the only one from the Ugandan situation that has faced trial at The Hague. And he was himself abducted by the LRA at, at the age of 10, but grew up in the LRA to become one of the rebel group's commanders. And he is now found guilty for crimes he himself also is a victim of. Thus, in a way, his case epitomizes the whole issue of agency and structure, of individual accountability for collective, complex, structural acts. And Ongwen isn't necessarily the one who's most, who is most culpable of the violent conflict in the North, right? So essentially, this whole situation really revealed a huge gap in what justice meant to different people, and not the least, who really had a say in determining what justice is or should be. Generally, the local population didn't want ICC justice or even see it as the primary solution to their conflict. Yet this was what was called for by the international community, the ICC, the UN, and not the least, these human rights NGOs. 
Um, and finally then, it also showed the significant role of these NGOs, because what I hadn't expected when I first started looking into this was how vocal, how articulated, and how powerful human rights NGOs were in having a say about what kind of justice should be done and to whom. So indeed, when I when I started looking further into the role of these human rights NGOs in international criminal justice, they were basically everywhere. They were also said so so incredibly steadfast in their belief in international criminal justice for mass violence. They were simply put at the forefront of the fight against impunity. And Karen Engel with others had edited a wonderful book about this. But I also quickly found that in the literature on the ICC and NGOs, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, were considered a global civil society achievement, a product of mass organization by these NGOs and of these human rights NGOs in particular. And NGOs were also involved at almost every step in sort of the international criminal justice chain from setting conflicts and, and international crimes on the international agenda to representing victims in court, to doing outreach to explain what was going on in the court to local populations, to lobbying states to sign up to the ICC or donate more money um, to do so to the court and so on. And this sort of integrated role made me formulate a much more broader research question driven mostly by curiosity. How can we understand this close relationship between global justice making global criminal justice making with global civil society. And to get at this to sort of uh, empirically address it, I broke the question down into three. Now, what is the role of NGOs in international criminal justice? And what characterizes punishment gone global? And how is international criminal justice constituted by and of the global? As such, though, the analytic aim in the book is to develop really a sociology of punishment for international criminal justice. And to do so, I build on a number of different disciplines and literature, such as, of course, criminology uh, and the subfield of, of supranational criminology, which has developed a late but now very substantial literature on international crimes and transitional justice, which scholars at your faculty have um, have been a major um, driver of, obviously. Um, but I also draw extensively on on international law and especially critical international law and, and critical international criminal justice scholarship. And the third major disciplinary strand is international relations theory and especially the body of work that deals with transnational advocacy networks and transnational field theory. Transnational advocacy networks uh, was was more sort of an, uh, well, we can go into these literatures obviously in the discussion part, but um, but I draw on the trans transnational field theory is, is more Bourdieu focused and transnational advocacy network does not deal as much with power as I wanted to to um, to do. Therefore, uh, the move to to the transnational field theory. My methodological approach was ethnographic, uh, but I think an unusually messy one uh, and perhaps a bit untraditional one also. Um, at least as a as a young PhD student, I had uh, sometimes uh, a hard time convincing my peers that were doing prison ethnography that what I was doing, just basically traveling, was also ethnography. Um, but uh, Borowoy uh, was an inspiration here with his work on multi-sided and transnational ethnography. And I did travel a lot. Uh, obviously, I spent a lot of time in the Netherlands, in The Hague, um, sort of in the networks surrounding the International Criminal Court uh, and these NGOs. Uh, and also I went to Uganda um, and to Rwanda. I went to the UK to do interviews with NGOs, to Belgium, uh, spoke to Norwegian diplomats and, and so forth. Uh, it was also uh, multi-sided in that different sites in, for instance, The Hague were relevant to me. Um, I, I will return to this, but I but I found like this, the cityscape uh, particularly 
uh, instrumental. I uh, I did um, I did you know doing sort of an ethnography of a messy aspect such as this. You have to follow something. You have to you know, pinpoint one thing that you are actually looking at. The the sort of the you know if you don't if you don't have a specifically uh, concrete site, you have to have something other thing that is a bit more concrete. And my more concrete thing was that I traced networks. Um, so I followed these networks of NGO advocacy, and I started out with this global NGO coalition that uh, that is the central uh, NGO um, because it is the coalition that that um, that um, that says to represent more than 2,500 civil society organizations. So it is sort of the voice of the NGO community. So I started out by by sort of interviewing and getting to know and focusing really on the secretariat of this uh, coalition NGO in The Hague. But then I also traced their networks into sort of the regions where they were involved. So to the national level, Uganda, and then also to the local level, northern Uganda. So trying to sort of map out and dissect these networks and how they're linked together. And I'll return to this shortly. Um, but I did have a dominant focus on The Hague, uh, which is this is where I spent most of my time. Um, but then my field work in Uganda, for instance, with, was more to to um, to look or to to make us consider a bit. What does The Hague look like from northern Uganda? That kind of questioning. Um, and ethnography, I think, is a great method uh, for many reasons, but I think it's particularly great because it um, it it has this sort of natural critical impulse to engage with the question of boundaries uh, of questions of sort of structures and the social conditions. But but with this, you know, to engage with the question of boundaries, I, I found this particularly or what I mean by that is that I didn't want to accept international criminal justice definitions on things. I didn't want to accept always the law that they that it posited and and how they how they sort of sideline critiques. I wanted to get out of their way of defining the problematique. So and, and ethnography allows you to do that also because you have to, to to ask these silly questions all the time and to sort of understand the field from from the inside out as a complete novice. Um, yes. So here are some of the, the pictures, obviously, from this this messy ethnography of mine. But then to to move into sort of the substantial parts uh, of the book, um, the, the second chapter, chapter two, basically maps out where international criminal justice takes place. Because one of my absolute motivations uh, for mapping it out as such was because because of the fact that international law has this sort of innate quality of always invoking the universal as if it is beyond space, beyond situatedness, beyond the political. And therefore, it became very important to me to show that it is not <laughs> and that it is, in fact, anchored in concrete places, in particular practices and in particular people, such as The Hague, the global city of justice making, as I call it, and where international justice is visibly celebrated. If you want to sort of visit international criminal justice, to put it that way, the Hague is it. The city also sort of heavily promotes itself as a global city of justice. And in the chapter, I, I unpack what I call a moral economy there, where the celebration of global justice is embedded, but also beneficial to their municipal economy. <coughs> And I and I contrast this sort of celebratory image of justice in The Hague with Uganda, where justice is almost invisible. When I did my field work, the ICC and the international NGOs were closed off behind compounds, right? And in the north, where the survivors of the conflict are, the ICC didn't actually have a physical presence at all. There were no door to knock on for victims of international crimes. So basically, I argued that there is a disconnect between the metropole and the periphery of global justice making, which is also apparent in other spaces of international justice. And I won't go 
more into all of them, but I also analyze social media, which is an important space for promoting and legitimizing international justice and the assembly of state parties meetings, which are annual diplomatic meetings on the court. <coughs> Apologies. So basically what the chapter does is to sort of tease out the north south or metropole periphery divide in international criminal justice while situating the transnational networks of NGOs as part of what I call international criminal justice geography of power. And having sort of established where international criminal justice takes place, the next chapter analyzes how these NGOs organize in order to promote the ICC. And in particular, I deconstruct the network structures of NGOs at the ICC and the centrality of this coalition that I just mentioned, the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, and its core member NGOs such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. And I basically show how these networks, while claiming to represent quote unquote global civil society and over 2,500 organizations worldwide, it really comes down to the power of about 10 organizations of large Western-based human rights NGOs who speak for, well, the rest. And I also show that while human rights NGOs serve an important role in international criminal justice as providers of moral authority, I argue that they are too embedded in the field of international criminal justice to claim a position of being neutral or to claim a position of being disinterested others that can speak truth to power, which has given them the power elsewhere. I mean, that the, the sort of the, the ability to speak truth to power is what has given them the power in a state centric order. I then probe deeper into the people that work on and for international criminal justice, specifically those that advocate for humanity, so to speak. What motivates them? How do they envision justice? What is their everyday life like working on these on these issues? And what became clear here, also through just sort of hanging out in The Hague, is that international criminal justice is also a lifestyle. Therefore, this chapter turns attention to what is often downplayed in studies of international law, namely the issue of class. The question that this chapter probes is thus sort of essentially the issue of whose imaginations of global justice become part of its materiality. Who gets to speak for humanity? Who gets to speak for justice? And perhaps not surprisingly, it finds that advocates of humanity predominantly belong to a class of transnational Western professionals. During my field work, um, all but one of NGO representatives were white. Uh, and this was this was at a time when the International Criminal Court had a big African um, legitimacy issue. Um, the field is also driven by by internships, right? The two thirds of the people that work at the International Criminal Court are, are interns. But questions can be asked about who can afford to work for free for for up to two years, really? Uh, and who gets a visa to hang around and wait in The Hague, right? Uh, an expensive capital in the midst of sort of fortress Europe. The five countries with the topmost professionals working at the ICC in 2012 were France with 45 professionals, the United Kingdom with 27 professionals, the Netherlands had 17, Canada 15 and Germany 13. By comparison, the situation countries Cote d'Ivoire, the DRC, Mali and Uganda had two professionals each working at the court. And I know that these numbers can change and I'm sure that they have by now. There has been an increasing focus on geographical representations in the institutions of international criminal justice. But still, these sort of simple observations illustrate some of the disconnections and the inequalities that are structurally embedded in the field. Anyway, now from having sort of mostly focused on the structures embedded in and productive of international criminal justice, the latter part of the book focused more on the dominating discourses and the assumptions and the mentalities in the field. So chapter five analyzes the cosmopolitan penal imaginary. 
building on Western domestic penality, delving into the relationship between human rights sensibilities and criminal justice mentalities in the fight against impunity for international crimes. And I find that sort of while non-punitive forces have a major place in the human rights sensibility, indeed, to the extent that the penal aspects of international criminal justice is given uncomfortably little weight, um, human rights have also sort of become a force of punitivism. And I show this, um, and I show sort of how this is particularly apparent in human rights NGOs approach to amnesties, uh, and that in the fight against impunity, human rights NGOs are at the forefront of penal policies with global objectives and global capacities. So sort of drawing on mainstream criminology Garland and applying a sociology of punishment perspective to the field of international criminal justice, the chapter really brings out the similarities and differences in penal imaginations between domestic and international criminal justice. And I, I write that where I argue that crucially International criminal justice is imagined and promoted by its advocate, uh, by its advocates as as a, as a form of social justice, albeit on a cosmopolitan scale. And I argue that while international criminal justice relies upon retributive and, and expressive undertones, it doesn't make any appeal to sort of punitive sensibilities. A fact that I think can be understood in light of this close relationship between international criminal justice and human rights NGOs. So through the fieldwork in Uganda and Rwanda, I describe how asymmetries and tensions emerge in international criminal justice, particularly between the national and the international, as international criminal justice both echoes the national and departs from it. For example, a lot of practical issues has simply not been thought of uh, when setting up the ICC, such as, for instance, what to do with acquittals and what to do about asylum seeking witnesses. Yet, uh, I also wrote right, though, that human rights NGOs, they rely too strongly on punitive answers and that amnesties can be just a matter of pragmatism, pragmatism in situations of profound violence. So while the ICC has both punitive and reparative aims, the situation in Northern Uganda demonstrates how international criminal justice became an impediment to peace because of its punitive and legalistic approach. Um, now, part of this chapter also lays sort of the, the foundation for an article published in Punishment uh, and Society. Um, the next chapter, uh, addresses victims and the figure of the victim is the sine qua non of the fight against impunity for international crimes. And much has been written about this uh, also by your colleagues and the chapter shows how victims are represented and how justice for victims is imagined in international criminal justice. So the first part focuses on imaginations of justice for victims and argues that the ICC represents a form of hybrid justice by incorporating restorative and transformative rationalities for justice. Yet a closer look at the implementation of these processes reveal a conspicuous discrepancy between ideologies and realities in international justice making. The second part of the chapter sees victims, maybe provocatively so, as a source of moral authority and one that is claimed in representational practices by both human rights NGOs and international criminal justice generally. To do, to do this, I sort of explore suffering as a type of currency, both on an individual level for victims advocates as their source of purpose, and on a broader cultural level as the source of this global moral outcry. And the chapter then demonstrates how the victim is culturally represented through imaginations from the global north and becomes universalized as a symbol of humanity of which the gendered and racialized victim of sexual and gender based violence provides particularly powerful victim imaginary. This argument is also refined in cooperation with my colleague Annette Hauge. Uh, in this way, the image of the victim of international crimes is characterized by her sort of essential otherness. It is humanity that suffers and obviously needs saving. So having sort of explored the cultural authority of the ICC, 
the NGO's claim for advocacy of humanity and the moral authority of victims, the final analytic chapter addresses sort of this pivotal question, who are we who punish, right? To what extent can international criminal justice be understood to reflect bonds of common values and beliefs, tradition and interest on the global scale? It is apt for analysis that positions punishment at the center of social organization. The chapter cultivates a Dukhemian approach to global justice uh, or to global justice making and argues that international criminal justice reinforces a social imaginary of cosmopolitan solidarity embodied in this notion of humanity. And this chapter thus demonstrates how agents of international criminal justice argue their cases and punish in the name of humanity. Yet, rather than something given, the cosmopolitan moral order embodied by humanity reflects a dominant moral order and one that is actively constituted in large part by these NGOs. And using sort of the Rome Statute of the ICC as a crowd bar for penal aid and rule of law promotion in the global south, I show how global justice making through international criminal law is intertwined with the promotion of rule of law and oh, rule of law promotion and penal aid in context of failed justice where cosmopolitan values and more specifically the cosmopolitan penal imaginary are supposed to spread through the notion of um, complementarity, positive complementarity. So global justice making through international criminal justice is thus a multi-scalar project and one which, although done in the name of solidarity, is coercively and deliberately implemented. And in this way, I hope to show how a sociological approach to international criminal justice reveals some of the ways in which moral, personal and social order is sought constituted globally. So the final chapter situates some of the book's major findings within contemporary resistance towards international criminal justice as global justice. And it addresses how current pushback um, against international criminal justice is part of the move towards a multipolar or multi-regional system of international relations. But also that the pushback is a result of the unevenness, the tensions and the disconnections as revealed throughout the book's analysis. So to return to the issues that I started out with, what is the role of NGOs in international criminal justice? Well, I argued that they contribute moral authority to the project of international criminal justice. And what characterizes punishment gone global? Well, I say that it is driven by humanitarian reason. And how is international criminal justice constituted by and of the global? I argue that it consolidates unequal power structures. But then it remains to be seen you know, what can be done to remedy the power inequalities embedded in the field of international criminal justice and who should address these questions?